Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our first of two webinars in this series on a community centered approach to healthcare. Um, today, we're going to be talking about an introduction to the community centered health home model. And I'm very excited to have some colleagues from the Prevention Institute, Katie and Sandra, with us here today. I'm going to hand it over to them in just a moment, but just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, today's webinar is funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, but does not necessarily reflect their uh, perspective. And uh, this webinar is hosted by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. If you're unfamiliar with us at the council, um, we are a, a national nonprofit. We uh, focus on training, advocacy, and research and the movement to end homelessness. Our mission is that we are grounded in human rights and social justice and seeking to build an equitable and high quality healthcare system uh, through training, research, and advocacy in the homelessness. Um, today is set up like a meeting. So there are opportunities during the Q&A where you may be able to come off mute, um, but we do ask that you stay on mute during the uh, webinar today, just to limit some background noise. Um, I just realized I did not introduce myself. I am Lauren Berner Davis. I am the Senior Research Manager at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Um, and I am just very excited about this webinar today. I am very excited about the CCHH model. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Katie and Sandra. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here with you today. I'm about to share some slides, but before I do that, I'm gonna put a question into the chat and I would love it if folks could introduce themselves through the chat function. Of course, unfortunately, in a group of this size and with this time, we don't have time to go around the room and do sort of more of a personal touch introduction like we would like to do. Um, but if you could share a bit about yourselves and where you're coming from in the chat, that'll help us get a sense of who all is here with us today. Um, as Lauren mentioned, we're from Prevention Institute. My name is Katie Miller. I'm a program manager at PI. I've worked here for just over eight years. Um, I'm based out of our Oakland office and I'm actually in our Oakland office unusually today. Um, I, my work at PI has primarily been in support of community partnerships involving healthcare organizations. I also provide some evaluation and sustainability support to our various project teams. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Sandra, who will introduce herself. Thank you, Katie. Hi, Katie. Um, hi, everyone. I am Sandra Vera. I'm a colleague of Katie's at Prevention Institute. I um, get the opportunity to work on our Healthy Equitable Communities branch of our organization, which houses projects that range from uh, focusing on equitable transportation, land use, to chronic disease prevention um, at the upstream levels, and thinking about how health care and health systems can also be involved in upstream prevention, health equity, and racial justice efforts. So we're going to talk a lot about all of those things today. So I will pause there and then just note that we're seeing some um, introductions on the chat. So welcome, Brooklyn, Michelle, Marcus, Elena. We're seeing some folks in there. I'm excited to to get to learn a little bit more about this group and invite you all to discussion and dialogue along the way. I think that's what Katie and I are really hoping um, to provide from our time together today and um, in the coming opportunity. I'll hand it back to you, Katie. Thanks, Sandra. We are going to have some chat questions for you throughout um, the PowerPoint presentation portion, and then we are gonna have time for Q&A and discussion at the end. Looking forward to um, talking with you more. All right, did my slide shift? I think they did, thumbs up. All right, awesome. So the picture you're seeing here is our main office in Oakland, California, um, which is where I'm working today. Um, Sandra's based out of our LA office. We also have smaller offices in Houston and Washington, DC. Um, Prevention Institute is a national nonprofit and our mission is to build prevention and health equity into key policies and actions at the federal, state, local, and organizational level to ensure that the places where people live, work, play, and learn foster health, safety, and well-being. That's a lot of things. Um, prevention and health equity are our major focuses at the policy and systems level. And today, we'll specifically be talking about healthcare organizations. 
a little bit about our health systems transformation work. Um, for over a decade, we've been working with healthcare organizations who are interested in exploring what their role can be in changing the community conditions that shape health, um, leveraging access to data, partnering with community-based organizations, and advocating for better policies and practices. One of our main areas of focus with healthcare has been through our community-centered health homes model, or CCHH model, which we'll call it for short, which is what we're gonna talk more about today. How many of you, I'm not gonna be able to see you since I'm uh, sharing my screen, but raise your hands anyway in your rooms or offices, wherever you are, if you've heard the term social determinants of health. I'm guessing a lot of you have. Talking about social determinants of health and addressing the social determinants of health has been a major focus of public health efforts over the past several years. When you think of social determinants, you might think about um, housing or food access or transportation. Um, and you would be correct. When we talk about strategies to address the social determinants, we might think about referral systems or vouchers to address those issues in the short term. Um, but to truly address social determinants issues in our communities, we have to think even further upstream to the root causes of those, what makes those conditions happen in the first place. What do we mean when we talk about working upstream? We found this graphic to be really helpful um, to share when we're presenting about our work and what we mean by working upstream. Um, I wanna start by saying that clearly, um, especially with COVID in the last few years, many of us have been thinking about urgent needs that you know, are more in the downstream sort of area. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're holding space for that reality um, and the considerations that come with that. Uh, there, are, there are moments in time uh, when resources and our focus are really needed downstream. Um, but we also know- I'm on the training. That the, Oh, you're gonna call me on your way back home? I didn't drive my mom picked me up and dropped me off. I just got Lauren. Um, we all know the conditions, policies, and systems that existed even before COVID are part of what exacerbated poor health outcomes for the communities we serve and made the impact of COVID even worse. Thinking about upstream opportunities through a model like CCHH gives us the opportunity to say, what do we want to change in the big picture? Perhaps we don't have the bandwidth to make that happen alone, but what could we do with partners? A lot of the movement we've seen in social determinants interventions have been midstream, um, which is right here in the middle where you see things like screenings and um, referral systems, community health workers, social workers, all the great work that those folks do. Um, what Prevention Institute is about, and the CCHH model in particular, um, is kind of building on some of those midstream interventions to create partnerships and move upstream for broader population impact. Um, would love for folks to share in the chat, where on this river graphic are your current efforts mostly focused? So you could say downstream, midstream, upstream, could be a mix of streams. <laughs> and where might you be interested in going next? I'm gonna take a moment. I see midstream, all right. I think that's definitely true for a lot of folks downstream, definitely want to go upstream, midstream. I, yeah, I would say a lot of the health centers in particular we've worked with over the years are primarily downstream, exploring midstream is usually where they are at the entry point where we start working with them and perhaps have done some upstream things without even really realizing that they're in that space. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that can look like as well. Thanks everybody for sharing. All right, so here's some examples. Um, the left-hand column is a little bit more in the midstream space. So you might already be linking patients to legal services through a medical legal partnership. A way to move upstream would be working with the city to enforce housing codes. You might be enrolling patients in health insurance. Moving upstream could look like advocating for universal access to insurance. You might be working to provide transportation vouchers. We know that transportation can be a huge barrier to accessing healthcare or lack of transportation can be. So vouchers are a great way to sort of address that in the medium term. Moving upstream could look like adopting policies to provide free bus passes to students or seniors. Um, you might be doing work to refer patients to food pantries. Moving upstream could be working on policy and systems efforts to improve the local food system. These are just a few examples. One health center that's been thinking about the social determinants of health for many, many years is St. John's Well Child and Family Center in Los Angeles. 
when we first started thinking about what a CCHH looks like in practice, we immediately thought about the housing work that St. John's was doing. This is about a decade ago. Through their patient intake process, they realized that many patients were coming in with bug bites and different skin allergens, skin conditions, and they started to track where they lived and try to figure out what were the commonalities. And they discovered that the majority of the patients coming in with these issues lived in the same housing complexes and had landlords who were not meeting housing codes. And so they worked, the health center leveraged their advocacy and expertise in the community to advocate for improvements in those housing conditions and for those landlords to be held up to code. More recently during COVID, um, St. John's was an advocate for vaccine, COVID vaccine distribution in health centers. When they were originally planning how vaccines would be distributed, they were focusing on hospitals and health systems. And there is not a major hospital located in South Los Angeles, which was one of the areas of LA that was most impacted by COVID um, outbreaks during this time. So they advocated with 40 other organizations. And ultimately the result was that COVID vaccines were delivered through the local health system or health, local health centers in St. John's. This is a huge victory for health equity and racial justice using advocacy and policy to achieve that aim. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what we mean by the social determinants of health and community prevention and community conditions and also how health equity and racial justice impact those as well. And I will turn it over to Sandra. Thank you, Katie. Um, so many of you, as you've noted, um, have been working on social determinants of health or have been interested in trying to find some existing pathways and opportunities to, to connect with that. I think we, in the last five, 10 years, have seen so much amazing work um, on whether it's health centers or other health system organizations that are thinking about the sort of holistic picture of clients or patients that they see and thinking about asking about their transportation opportunities, their employment, the, the food access they have, the housing access um, and security they have. Um, and that's incredibly important so that we are as practitioners, as advocates, really understanding the, to the totality, the whole picture of what um, people, residents, community members um, are experiencing and impacted on. And so I think there is a range there that we can continue to build, which is to look um, at those same questions, but think about it at a community level. So not only the folks are, that we're seeing come into clinic doors or hospital doors, um, but their families and their neighbors and the broader neighborhoods um, around that. And what the data overwhelmingly tells us is that health is really connected to factors outside of healthcare services, that healthcare services play a critical, important role in supporting health issues, um, complicated health statuses, and, and we need to do better to create more accessible, affordable, culturally effective healthcare services. And we also need to look at the environments and the, the factors outside of those. So um, many of you have likely seen this breakdown of the factors that influence health that come from county health rankings. So 20% really being associated directly with clinical care, but the physical environment, social and economic factors, behaviors, representing kind of the, the majority of the factors that influence health. So if that's really what the data tells us, that's what our experiences tell us from the stories, the experiences that we hear or that we have as well um, in our communities, then we need to sort of connect and align our efforts in that, in that way. Next slide, please, Katie. Many of you also have been working in and navigating the space of going from a focus on health disparities, differences um, in the rates of health outcomes, of poor health outcomes um, or access and moving towards health equity. So we always feel like it's important to just kind of offer one description or definition of health equity so that we can kind of carry that into some of the examples and in the model that we're, we're going to share. So um, here for us, we're going to offer that health equity means that every person, regardless of who they are, the color of their skin, their level of education, their gender, sexual identity, 
whether or not they have a disability, the job that they have or the neighborhood that they live in has an equal opportunity to achieve optimal health. We really want to get to the opportunity, but also the outcome um, of optimal health. So that's kind of some of the container that we really want to offer. Next slide, please. Now, as many of you have shared and noted, um, we're working in, in different levels of of prevention, the different streams of prevention. But one of the things that always comes up for me as I look at that image is that they're connected. We're not talking about down, you know, downstream prevention over there, midstream, midstream prevention here, and upstream prevention over there. They are all connected and there is fluidity um, between those things. And we need to work at all of those different levels if we're gonna have that bigger change and bigger impact that we're looking for. But it's helpful to look at the broader picture and how we can all work more closely together and in alignment. Um, and one of the things that we've done is sort of try to create some resources, graphics, tools to hold that information and to hold that connection so that we can map out and consider where are we, where do we need to be, what will it take to get there. So when we think about inequities in health and wellness, we, of course, can make connections to exposures and behaviors. As Katie's example um, of St. John's um, mentions, that if we are seeing issues um, of um, asthma or respiratory uh, illnesses, we need to look at what the immediate exposures are around individuals and what are their behaviors so that we can make the connection between source. But we also need to continue to move that lens into well, what's the source of those expo exposures and behaviors. In this case, it was poor housing conditions um, of which many individuals are not able to control or influence in a meaningful manner to prevent that level of physical exposure that leads to those health issues. So moving into the community determinants of health. What is housing health look like for, um, for our communities, for folks who are experiencing these deep inequities in health and wellness, and recognizing that those community determinants, we're thinking about housing, food access, transportation, um, the ability to engage in our local communities and then bring our voices, those themselves are actually embedded in broader structural um, systems that affect how power, um, financial resources, influence um, is, is, is produced. And so we have to make those connections. And that can feel big and overwhelming because we do have a specific opportunity mandate focus, um, whether in your health system, health system or nonprofit like, like Katie and I are part of. But it's important to kind of look at the broader picture. Next slide, please, Katie. So to give us a, just a, a reminder of how um, these structural drivers of the past and of the present continue to affect our, um, our health and well-being today, we're just showing some images that may um, bring up policies or practices in the past that continue to affect our health and well-being today. So here we see um, an image uh, recollection really of the mid 1900s where, where uh, segregation was really the policy and practice within society. Um, now we could think about this as only existing in the past, but we have to recognize, we have to acknowledge that past policy um, continues to affect us on a, on a daily, regular basis. Next slide, please. It just doesn't look exactly the same in each community. This comes from, um, from Brooklyn. I know we have some participants from that area. Um, and this was shared with us many years ago um, and I think went viral at some point on social media, but a playground um, that had this play structure here, which clearly cues up um, a jail system. Um, and we, we, you have to stop and think sort of what are the norms? Um, what are the cues that we're putting out there for our, you know, our young children? Um, so there are still policies or still practices um, that continue to, to affect the way that people and entire communities are able to access and achieve health and safety and well-being and prosperity in their communities. Next slide. 
Here is an example um, from our Native American and Indigenous communities that was shared with me and, and some work I was doing um, with, uh, with youth in the Sacramento area of Northern California, um, just sort of showing, again, past policy practice um, uh, and segregation um, and discrimination with our Native American and Indigenous populations. Next slide, please. And seeing still a huge, critical impact um, on the in indigenous populations and in uh, Native American and indigenous women in particular who have some of the highest rates of, um, of violence and, and lack of safety issues happening as well. Next slide. And for many of those who of us who are in and uh, have been working in health and in public health, we, need, we have learned more and more in recent years about the impact of things like transportation policy and how the creation of highway systems have divided communities and in fact separated oftentimes in many uh, cases, in most cases, communities of color from economic opportunity, from jobs, from um, quality education, um, and from the ability to you know, breathe uh, clean air as well. And so that we're seeing the impact of and continue to see the impact of. Uh, next slide, please. In the area of chronic disease prevention, so much work in the last decade um, or so on um, access to healthy food environments and, and having the healthy choice be the default choice. Um, and the policies of, of land use and siting um, and economic development, development really affecting communities of color um, and uh, immigrant communities uh, as well. So these are all of the big factors, the big issues that we're all facing. And we mentioned this not to sort of add to the overwhelm or to the intensity of all the things that we know um, our communities are, are dealing with, but to just assure you that the forces that we are all up against and that you see coming through your doors every day are big and are deep and need systemic change. So we have to do the work every day of providing access to good quality, effective care. Um, and if we, if we don't also partner with and work um, upstream, we just won't have that level of, of impact um, that we all want to see. So making those connections um, is really important. Next slide, please, Katie. So let me pause there for a moment and just ask you, given that we're all in different places and working in different communities, um, to just take a moment. What local or regional policies or practices have produced inequities that you see in your work um, and on your on the daily on your daily basis. So I'm going to pause here for a minute and give folks just a chance to reflect on that and drop some thoughts over chat. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, I think we have that opportunity too. So really, just open and and curious what's coming up for you. Brooklyn Booker, thank you for dropping some thoughts in the chat. Further development of, pre of previously rural areas, further displacing our patients. Yeah, driving them further from resources. Absolutely. So development, um, pushing folks further out and making it harder to access resources, to get to uh, resources. Absolutely. School funding being tied to property taxes, it just creates an entire loop um, that produce issues in, in inequity, absolutely, and in health. Um, source of uh, income discrimination, blocking use of housing choice uh, vouchers and rapid rehousing placements. Yep, absolutely. Emily sharing also, oh, uh, we have two Emilys. Yeah, back-to-back -back Emilys. Um, Non-reliable public transportation. Yep, and we know that public, the source of transportation for public housing, both at the lo local, regional, and 
um, state or federal level is, you know, constantly fluctuating. And there's so much of a fight to try to preserve resources for uh, public transportation, rising costs in transportation and lack of public transportation, especially in rural communities. Absolutely. All the ways that these um, structural drivers and these factors play out in communities. Um, Benita is sharing that when um, when Benita served homeless clients or many transportation, little to no housing access, no access to shelter if COVID positive, absolutely. So this creates, you know, we often talk about it as a snowball effect, right? Um, and it's really hard to disentangle one thread from all of these things that are woven together and that really connect to broader community and societal um, problems and solutions as well. Um, next slide please, Katie, I think we had one more question. Urban re revitalization, driving up housing rates and causing people to leave their neighborhoods. Absolutely. I mean, I know that's happening in so many different places across the country. Um, and we see the impact not only of the places that are that folks are leaving from, but are going to, and how those communities can absorb and create opportunity and space for the residents um, that are moving in that area. Um, so, out of all of these, uh, all of these policies, practices, observations, um, which populations are most impacted by these inequities in your community? Folks who have shared or maybe haven't even shared yet, what is that looking like? Who's most impacted? Low income, low income communities, absolutely, and low income residents immigrant population, BIPOC population. I think that's probably a theme. Um, if we were to go kind of down the line, people uh, experiencing um, homelessness, absolutely. So I, I think if we were to kind of matrix this out, if we were to look at those who mentioned transportation, housing, um, food, education, you, we could probably find that um, same or similar populations are affected by all of these things. Yep, folks talking about sort of why that might be the case. Um, yes. Okay, the chat's frozen, but yes, I was seeing some good, yep, people have been historically uh, impacted by systems and continue to be. Um, so, and the system's kind of working in that way. Um, I, I think part of what we talk about um, in prevention um, and in health equity and racial justice is it's not happenstance that we are seeing kind of predictable outcomes in health, safety, well being, and injustice um, because the system designs it that way. So, we need um, to to go back and address these issues. Um, so folks, you know, continue to add low income, elderly and seniors, veterans, those facing language barriers, yep. Um, uh, people in community with disabilities, absolutely. So in, next slide, please, maybe. Um, we know the work then that we uh, have to do. And even if we need to really focus our efforts and resources on downstream, making the connections to those that are working on midstream efforts and upstream efforts, I think will allow us to push back and address what we know are at the root cause of a lot of, um, of inequities. So the example um, we're sharing here, and this comes from a resource that we have an offer at no cost and Katie and I will put together a whole list of um, reading material and listening material if you're interested, um, but seeing how all of these policies and practice um, together um, have created this sort of systematic way in which we're getting to these poor health outcomes and uh, outcomes and, and equity um, are important. And even very well-meaning policy or policy that at one time provided opportunity um, have been implemented and over time uh, in ways that have led 
to the huge gaps um, and issues in, in our broader um, systems of transportation, health, uh, and, and so many more. Uh, next question. So next slide, sorry. Um, so how do we, you can go to the next slide. So how do we move from that? How do we go from these big structural drivers, these big community determinants of health and move into actionable, impactful um, opportunities? Next slide, please. Um, so one of the ways that we offer, and that's drawn from the work, um, uh, I'm thinking particularly of USC's program for environmental and regional equity that offers sort of framework for operationalizing equity. So if we wanna move into health equity, into racial justice, how do we do that? So we do that kind of by having three lenses, um, past disadvantage and a focus on closing historic gaps to improve health and economic uh, opportunities in vulnerable communities, communities made vulnerable. Uh, contemporary participation engages in shared decision-making through community-based participation and elevating, prioritizing, centering the perspectives of vulnerable communities. Um, and then future consequences, thinking about how all of the policies, practices that we're putting forth um, how those will impact those same populations and communities that we're trying to support um, and making sure that we are tracking uh, what we are doing and the impact that we're having so that we can make the adjustments and the changes um, so as not to perpetuate the same systems that have led us to where we are. Um, so that's kind of the overarching kind of how, but I think we have a lot more to offer in terms of how healthcare centers and how health systems are doing this type of work. So for that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Katie. Thanks, Sandra. So as Sandra just said today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about the role healthcare can play in operationalizing equity and improving community conditions through the CCHH model. Over the past several years, funders and community coalitions have been engaging healthcare organizations and systems to strengthen their coalition work. Healthcare's primary mission, as we talked about, is to treat those who are already sick or injured, um, but increasingly focusing on preventative care for individuals. However, some healthcare organizations, and particularly community health centers and FQHCs, were born out of community organizing efforts. Um, one example that we go back to a lot is the work of um, Drs. Jack Geiger and John Hatch in the Mississippi Delta when they were building the Delta Health Center back in the 60s. From the very beginning, they were intentionally engaging residents to learn more about their needs beyond immediate treatment. Um, a couple of the needs that they really focused on were um, access to food and economic opportunities. So they worked on developing food pharmacies, um, doing more workforce development opportunities and setting up the food pharmacies, and really wanted to look at the ways that they could more broadly impact the health of their patients. Over a decade ago, um, after the Affordable Care Act was passed and implemented, healthcare really started talking about this idea of moving from volume to value. And if I could see your faces, I would do a hand raising thing again to see who has heard the phrase from volume to value. This idea is that the legislation and policies that were being passed like the Affordable Care Act might incentivize healthcare payment systems to pursue prevention if they were reimbursed not for the number of patients they saw, but instead for improving patient and community health. So inspired by the work of Drs. Hash and Geiger in Mississippi, like we talked about, um, Prevention Institute began researching how healthcare organizations were already engaging in community prevention and discovered community health centers were particularly oriented towards a prevention approach. What we learned about these health centers and some of the common um, attributes and activities that they were participating in um, inspired the development of the CCHH model. And we released our first paper on the model back in 2011. Since we first introduced the paper, um, the CCHH model has been formally piloted in 27 healthcare organizations across the country, actually primarily in the South, um, in Louisiana, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Texas, addressing issues like food insecurity, poor housing, workplace environmental hazards, lack of neighborhood parks and playgrounds. In 2019, we published a second edition of the paper, um, and that's the cover that you see here, which describes healthcare organizations' experiences piloting the CCHH model and some of our updated thoughts um, and feelings about how the model should work, um, both you know, as a theory and in practice. It includes some practical strategies for implementation. It also has an assessment tool that health centers can use 
to sort of gauge current capacity and progress. So the definition of a community-centered health home is an organization that not only acknowledges that factors outside the clinic walls affect patient health outcomes, but it actually actively participates in including them. While CCHH is a framework that's designed with the history, assets, and structures of community health centers in mind, it can be applied broadly to health systems, um, hospitals, and to even non-healthcare organizations, uh, public health departments, which I know often do a mix, community-based organizations. Um, it can be applied by school districts, nonprofits. So there's really, while it is focused on those who are coming from a healthcare background, it does have broader applicability as well. It's really about working in partnership to leverage strengths and sometimes limited resources to have the broadest impact possible. And as reflected in the name, it's really about taking action in a way that's community-centered. So this is the updated model graphic that was a core part of that new paper that was released in 2019. Um, the model we decided and discovered was really not linear. Are the previous versions sort of had inquiry analysis and action as like steps one, two, three. And what we discovered was that people were sort of entering from different places in the model. And also that the model was a little bit of a continuous loop. And so that's what we really tried to show here. In today's webinar, we're primarily going to focus on how health centers engage in external work through partnership, which are what we call the functional capacities. This is the outer ring of the model of inquiry, analysis, and action. In next month's webinar, we'll talk more about the foundational capacities in the center of the model. Those are the actions that organizations would take internally to advance and sustain this kind of work. So we've talked a little bit about policies and inequities and injustices and community conditions that can impact health. I want to talk about how this played out in one specific neighborhood and the action that a health center there took to address those conditions. So I'm going to talk about Asian Health Services, which is an FQHC that is located in Oakland's Chinatown neighborhood. It's about four blocks from where I sit right now. Um, Oakland's Chinatown is the nation's fourth largest Chinatown. Um, the historic Chinatown community is an integral social and economic component of the city of Oakland, but it has experienced a continuous decline in economic development and equity, despite a surge of development in neighboring areas. And part of the reason for this, I think back to one of the graphics that Sandra shared, was how the freeway system was built here. And the fact that the on-ramps and off-ramps to a major interstate right here, as well as the entrance to the city of Alameda, are in Chinatown and unfortunately kind of cut it off from other neighborhoods in the area and really brought a large number of cars and traffic into this highly pedestrianized neighborhood. Um, it's a low income community, primarily composed of immigrants and seniors, disproportionately impacted by a series of poor transportation planning measures. And it was experiencing the highest number of pedestrian injuries and fatalities in the city of Oakland. Um, Asian Health Services is located right in the middle of this community and it had been providing care for pedestrians who were hit by cars right outside. One, time, one day, um, unfortunately, an elderly resident of the community was hit by a car right outside and died. And he was actually the father of a board member. And this was sort of the thing that brought Asian Health Services finally to say, we need to take action to figure out what's going on in our community and what we can do to address it. And so they started working on a pedestrian safety campaign. So as part of that process, they started working with the city of Oakland, um, the Oakland Chinatown Chamber of Commerce, and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So the partners who wanted to explore what the current infrastructure, what was happening with the infrastructure that made the neighborhood so vulnerable, um, they went out and they just started looking at what was going on in the community. Um, they had students who were standing on street corners and kind of counting the number of cars, counting the number of pedestrians, and gathering some really good quantitative information. Um, the current infrastructure prioritized the passage of cars and pedestrians were having to cross that poorly marked crosswalk in a very short amount of time. Many of the residents, as I mentioned, were elderly. So even in crosswalks where they did have a countdown clock, it was not enough time for them to cross the street safely. So gathering information about what's going on in the community to cause or exacerbate a health and safety issue is what we call in the model inquiry. So this is basically gathering information about what is going on. The next phase is analysis, and there's two important processes that happen in the analysis phase. The first is taking the information you already have, this quantitative information we talked about gathering, 
but also talking about it with residents and gather, getting their qualitative perspective, finding out about you know, their lived experience and the contextual factors that are taking place in the community. But also getting their input on what strategies they wanna collectively pursue to address the issue that's been identified. So it's not just about community engagement, but it's about community empowerment and really putting the community at the center of the action that you wanna to take to address an issue. Um, the second part of the analysis phase is really building and consolidating the core partners for the long-term sustainability of the work. So this is um, Prevention Institute's collaboration multiplier tool. And what this tool does is it kind of provides a framework for showing different partners who might be working on an issue together, individually identifying expertise, desired outcomes, and key strategies, and then really um, identifying and developing some shared outcomes, some shared strengths, and the joint strategies and activities they hope to undertake together. And this shows four of the key sort of sectors who were at play in this work in Chinatown. So the transportation department, like we talked about, um, health services, that would be Asian health services, um, the local business community, and other community resident groups. These are the priorities and shared outcomes that they developed as a group. It's not just about pedestrian safety, but it's also about economic development and economic equity. It is about the physical development, not just in Chinatown, but also in the communities nearby and how that affects traffic there. And then finally, transportation development in the neighborhood itself to improve safety. With these priorities set, Asian Health Services and its partners were prepared to take action. So one reason that we like to use this example is because there's a very physical, very visual representation of the action that was taken and the outcome. And that is, um, this crosswalk you see here, there are actually four of them um, that were um, implemented in the heart of Chinatown, um, collaboration of all of those agencies that we talked about. Um, it's a scramble system, so you can cross you know, regular sort of 90 degree angle ways, you can cross diagonally, and the lights are set up so pedestrians all cross at once. So there's never a time where cars and pedestrians are in conflict, cars can't go if pedestrians are going and vice versa. And the countdown clocks are much, much longer to give folks an opportunity to cross the street. So rather than competing with cars, now they're, it's really prioritizing the passage of pedestrians in this community. So these improvements are part of a long-term vision for revitalizing Oakland Chinatown. So it's not just about the crosswalk, it's about economic development, physical development, and sustaining community partnerships. So the steering committee continues to meet um, to move forward projects under the ban banner of Revive Chinatown. In the years since the system was implemented, Asian Health Services continues to serve as a voice and convener for the community. They advocate for other issues statewide. They led the charge on um, new regulations and laws and policies to protect male salon workers throughout the state of California. Um, this is a story that's highlighted in our second edition paper. It also got um, some press coverage in the New York Times a few years ago. I think this was around 2019, 2018 as well. Asian Health Services is really the epitome of a community health center. It's physically centered in the community it serves, but it's also serving both the clinical and community needs of the residents in Chinatown. For folks who like data on outcomes, we have this lovely chart that shows a 50% reduction um, in auto pedestrian con flicks in Chinatown after this was implemented. Considering the challenges the last few years have presented for healthcare in particular, working in partnership is essential to moving forward upstream change. Healthcare at its core is primarily still about treatment. Um, and with times like this with a pandemic in the mix and all sorts of other crazy things going on in the world, healthcare may have to step away or be less present in coalition work. And that's okay. But we also know that COVID has highlighted the deep inequities in our community and underscored the need for systems change. So this type of work and approach in partnership with others is more relevant than ever. If you had a few takeaways from today, I would hope that they would include um, the importance of leveraging the complementary assets of partners to move forward the work effectively. Starting with the data you have, which may come from partners in the community first. It also may come from your internal um, data gathering processes as well. There's a number of ways to think about data. Um, supporting community residents and taking action, really making sure that when we say we're community centered, it's not just you know, the physical community, but it's community residents themselves. 
And, and finally, that CCHH is not just a program, a standalone program that's funded. It's everything about the way an organization operates. And we are going to dig into that more in next month's webinar, talking about sort of like the brass tacks of what that could look like and how you can implement and sustain that. Um, but I think this could be a nice time to check in with you all to hear, well, one, how any of this is landing with you, but particularly how the themes of CCHH are coming up in your own work and community. Um, what aspect of the model you might wanna learn more about when we get together next time. Um, anything else related to the model that could be interesting. And I am going to stop sharing in case there are people popping up on screen so I can see you. All right, so the two questions were, how is, are the themes of CCHH coming up in your work? And or which aspect of the model would you be curious to learn more about? You can put it in chat, you can raise your hand, or you can unmute. Okay, while folks are thinking, I will share that for many health centers that we have worked with, they naturally gravitate towards the inquiry part of the model. They want to think about data. I think because data is something that they have some more immediate control over, or it might be something they're already gathering or thinking about. Maybe you use the prepare tool to look at social determinants of health. Um, I think that is a place that a lot of folks gravitate. Um, others are already working in community coalitions and might um, sort of be entering the model from the analysis phase, really doing some um, combined uh, priority setting. And some health centers or organizations are already doing policy advocacy. How long did it take to get the plan implemented? Did they present to city officials? It took a year to get the plan approved. I'm not sure how much longer after that it was for the for the actual physical infrastructure change to take place. And yes, they, they did present it to city officials. They work closely with the city of Oakland and the city's transportation department all throughout the process. Thanks for that question. Hey, this is Nita. I'll just unmute. Um, was there initial uh, pushback from the city on this plan? I do not think that they encountered significant pushback, but I think in some ways it's the part of the coalition that they built before they even kind of went to the city with the plan. I think engaging the Chamber of Commerce and the local business association allowed them to kind of lean a little bit more sort of political weight onto, um, onto the city. Also, you know, one of the assets that health centers and health systems have are, you know, physicians and physician advocates. And a lot of times, you know, for various reasons, if you get somebody in front of a city that has MD after their name, people listen, it really makes a difference. Um, and Asian health services definitely leverage um, their political clout in that way. So I don't, I, I do not recall in this situation that they face significant opposition. I do think the work for the nail salon workers, though, um, the policy work that happened at the state was much more of an uphill battle. Well, great I job, great work. Yeah, Great thanks. Work. And, you know, it, this this actually happened a number of years ago. It's been well over a decade because I think we included this story in the original 2011 paper, Sandra. Um, but what's been interesting is that we've continued to collaborate with them and we've done some co-presenting with them where they share a bit about how the relationships and the advocacy muscle that they built through that process, um, how they've applied it to some of their other work, including the, the Healthy Nail Salon Worker Policy Work and Collaboration. Let's see, okay, building health centers um, in high needs of codes, that is a great idea. Um, our colleagues in Florida, through the CCHH initiative that we worked on there, really focused on that. City data, we come through that, how you identified what you wanted to prioritize. I'll have to check on that question, Mariah. I see that about the data. I do not personally off the top of my head have that data, but we may have um, that in some of our previous publications or some more information about where you can find that. And that's not um, what was coming. 
Yeah. Sorry. Um, what was coming up for me and Mar Mariah's comment and question too was um, this wasn't exactly what I just shared on the chat and what we'll follow up with wasn't exactly what Asian Health Services used, um, but it made me think about some of the work that some of our colleagues at our organization have been doing in the past year with um, different community groups and um, building on a tool that we have called Thrive, which is a tool for health resilience and vulnerable environments that is a sort of community determinant of health um, sort of assess opportunity assessment and um, a group of young uh, leaders in Albuquerque, New Mexico took that tool and that assessment and made it their own for their community and kind of geared it towards a mental health and well-being, but still connected to physical, economic, and social um, domains and community terms of health. So I'm offering that because I think maybe just hearing kind of things that folks are working on or interested in, it may be interesting to spark um, some thinking or some reflection on how you may already be asking similar types of questions or get ideas for new ways um, and new questions and areas of inquiry for, for, your, uh, for your work there. Um, so that was just a thought. Katie, I think I like interrupted something you might've been thinking about for another comment. No, you're fine. I'm I'm looking through the chat. I'm seeing a number of folks talking about the work they're doing focused on populations of people experiencing homelessness and some great examples about, you know, connecting to services, building physical spaces, respite centers, um, you know, more houses and properties. I think building small homes has been popular in some communities. Um, I think, you know, with health centers and hospitals, housing and homelessness is a huge, huge issue that we often see folks address. And in a different slide that exists in a different presentation, Sandra, I'm thinking about, we actually kind of have a breakdown of addressing housing at downstream, midstream, and upstream. Um, I think as health systems in particular um, think more upstream, they can be looking at things like um, minimum wage, livable wages, um, sort of economic development communities and um, how the economic uh, landscape drives homelessness, um, whether people can afford to live in certain places, looking at gentrification, um, looking at you know predatory lending policies and trying to reverse predatory lending policies. Sandra, um, I'm gonna look to you for a second to give me a couple other examples, but some of the more upstream housing solutions that folks could also be thinking about. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I will say many of you might have participated in this, just thinking about, you know, um, at the sort of onset of the pandemic, so many voices coming from health centers, hospitals, um, other types of health system, um, advocating for stabilizing housing for 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 everyone, um, given the the big economic, um, you know, dip that we were in, and so. Uh, there's been so many amazing voices that have added to that to, to do things like emergency moratoriums or um, access to you know emergency housing vouchers and, and keeping that thread going. And I think now maybe the opportunity is how to continue to use those um, uh, you know advocacy muscles, those voices, um, the partnerships and relationships that many folks have built with their local uh, elected officials, appointed officials, helping to inform them and give them the information and data, and also inform them about the strategies that are in place in other communities that they could be that they could be using. So I think I've seen that really um, come up for some of the communities that that we've had an opportunity to partner with or work with um, is kind of thinking about what are the the federal, state, local, regional mechanisms that support things like um, stable and affordable housing in, in the long run. Um, and that's great reminder. Um, Katie, we brought together a few of those partners um, on an episode of our Moving Upstream podcast series um, on equitable housing. So invite you to join uh, to join that one. It was recorded be right before the pandemic. So um, just yeah. keep that in mind. We didn't know what we were about to enter uh, as we were recording some of that. Um, Marcus. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a good point. Yeah. I want to go back and listen to it, Katie. Now I'm like, whoo. Uh, Marcus yeah. is talking about how he uh, works in the healthcare data space. Curious what type of data sources um, are being combined for these assessments. We're looking for referral tools that we could promote to case managers to use. Um, Brooklyn actually had 
um, can offer some good information. So that's great. We want to make sure those connections are happening. Um, I know for some of the work uh, that we're supporting, Marcus, um, the types of data, they're sort of, uh, I would say, braided together. So there are things like hospital needs assessments um, that come out regularly that folks are really drawn to, some of the state surveys um, that um, are done, but also we're seeing health centers and organizations sort of develop their own tools and assessments. So one of the ones that we mentioned was Thrive, which can kind of be adapted and modified based on community. Um, and Katie, I think you were mentioning too, the the, the prep tool, I think we've we've heard um, a lot of- Prepare. Yeah. Prepare, sorry. Yes, prepare um, mm -hmm. as well. So um, just some ideas there, Marcus, but it sounds like Brooklyn might be able to, to connect you with a few more and we can certainly think uh, about others that might be of interest. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that. And thanks for asking the question about data. I mean, I will say, like, in the interest of full disclosure, like, we are not a hugely, like, quantitative data focused organization, we look a little bit more at qualitative data and narrative data and experiential data. Um, but I think the Thrive tool really is a great way to think about how you can ask questions or reframe questions that get answers that speak more to community conditions rather than needs for services. Um, and I say that because you probably are already asking questions that get to needs for services. So it's just a way you can think about posing some new or additional questions as well. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll, but we can keep the discussion going. I just didn't wanna surprise anybody with the poll popping up. Um, but this is just yeah. a quick three, four question evaluation um, that can really help uh, make sure that we're meeting what everybody's looking for. Thanks, Lauren. And I just put our email addresses into the chat. Um, I hope most of you are going to be able to join us when we come back next month to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of implementing the model, sharing some more examples of what that looks like in person. But if you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me and Sandra, um, and we can talk a little bit more both about the CCHH model or you know, if you're interested in some of our broader work around housing as an organization or anything else we do, we'd be happy to answer your questions. And we'll be back for more. So we can always kind of carry that over too. So do please um, reach out and, and let us know what would be helpful to, to focus on. All right, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to say thank you again um, to Katie and Sandra for being with us today. And we hope that um, the rest of the folks on the call will be able to join us again on April 20th. Um, thank you all for taking the time and participating in the chat. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing what more we can do in this space. Um, please just take a, a couple seconds to finish up the evaluation and hope to see you again in a couple weeks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.